2016 election today. So the big question is what's at stake? And what's at stake really is Obama's legacy. So President Obama has often called climate change the greatest long-term threat facing the world. And in response, his administration has passed several programs independent of Congress that are intended to combat the potential impacts of man-made climate change. Today, we'll be focusing on the Obama administration's climate change policies and environmental regulations. Although it is worth noting that there's a debate over the causes of climate change and the appropriate governmental responses, if any governmental responses should be made to climate change. Um, we cover these debates on our site and I will link in those pages later. If you wanna get more into the political dynamics around climate change. Um, so today we'll be talking about the Paris Agreement, um, which is like a big component of Obama's climate legacy. A big portion of domestic policy that feeds into the Paris Agreement. There's also the water rule mercury and air toxic standards, the ozone rule, and then other issues like federal land issues and water regulation and funding. All right, the Paris Agreement is a major climate change initiative that's been um, introduced or has been signed onto by the Obama administration. So the goal of the agreement is to keep a uh, greenhouse gas induced increase in, temperature, in global temperatures below two degrees Celsius by the end of the century and to limit any temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial levels. The agreement doesn't put any punitive penalties on countries that do not set and achieve policies to mitigate these greenhouse gas emissions. The, the agreement depends mainly on public and international pressure on countries to meet their goals. Uh, the United States under, the, under President Obama has joined the agreement, but debate remains over whether the agreement is legally binding. Uh, if the agreement had new legal obligations for the United States, or if the U.S. couldn't meet its obligations without additional authority from Congress, those factors would suggest that the agreement is a treaty in need of Senate ratification as required by the Constitution. On the other hand, some have argued the agreement is an executive agreement, which is made solely on the basis of the president's constitutional authority. Uh, the Obama State Department has indicated that the agreement is an executive agreement that can go forward without ratification from the Senate. Others, including members of Congress, have argued that the agreement is a treaty in need of ratification. And this will most likely come up uh, after the 2016 election. And a large part of the United States' involvement in the clean power or in the Paris Agreement is the Clean Power Plan, which Kayla will talk about next. Yes, so the Clean Power Plan is also known as the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA's 111D rule because it's based in Section 111D of the Clean Air Act. The goal of this plan is to limit carbon dioxide emissions from power plants and the, the eventual, the end goal of the program is to decrease carbon dioxide emissions by 32% by 2030. The plan was proposed in 2014, and then a group of states and other um, energy industry and other groups uh, sued against the rule. This map on the slide, you can see states that sued to stop the rule from going into effect are the states in light purple, whereas the states that are dark purple are states that have supported the rule through friend of the court briefings. Um, and so then this, uh, this case has been winding its way through the courts. And in February of this year, the Supreme Court put the plan on hold. Last month, the DC Circuit Court reviewed the rule and then they're expected to rule on the plan's legality later this year after the election. Uh, next is the Waters of the United States rule. Um, so in 2015, the EPA and the US Army Corps of Engineers issued a rule expanding the scope of waters protected under the Clean Water Act. Specifically, the rule is focused on clarifying which surface waters are regulated. Um, this is meant to um, clear up some of the regulatory uncertainty in the past 15 years as a result of several Supreme Court decisions. So to expand federal jurisdiction by declaring some types of waters um, under federal jurisdiction just by rule. And so these waters will be subject subject to the Clean Water Act's permit and other requirements if pollution, pollutant discharges occur in those waters. Uh, supporters of the rule have argued that it clears up um, much, or much regulatory uncertainty over the past few years and that it will protect 
ecosystems and waters and wetlands and um, places where recreational fishing and flood control occurs. While opponents have argued that the rule would unnecessarily expand regulations to cover waters that were not previously regulated, and this might have the, the effect of requiring property owners to be subject to a, um, a very extensive permitting process if they want to make changes to their land. There's also um, a question about the impact on agriculture. Uh, ag the agriculture is concerned how the rule would affect day-to-day -day operations. Although the EPA's final rule has exempted these activities, day-to-day um, far -day farming activities from regulation, um, agriculture groups and property rights groups are still um, a bit concerned that the rule can negatively affect farmers and other property owners. And the legality is also a major issue. Um, the question is whether the federal government's interpretation of the Clean Water Act is consistent with prior Supreme Court rulings and whether the rule complies with certain substantive and procedural requirements of the Clean Water Act and other federal laws. And so in October 2015, a uh, three-judge panel on the U.S. Court of Appeals placed a nationwide hold on the rule pending further developments. Uh, the two-judge majority found that the plaintiffs have a good uh, have a good case on perhaps on the substance of the issue, and that um, the case will likely become before the Supreme Court within the next two years. Mats refers to mercury and air toxic standards for power plants. So in 2011, the EPA issued a rule limiting the amount of mercury and other air pollutants emitted by power plants, and these standards are currently being implemented. Uh, the standards target mercury and other pollutants from over 580 coal and oil-fired power plants nationwide. Um, the rule is part of the Obama administration's larger policy limiting emissions from power plants. Um, the EPA's official cost estimate is that these standards would cost the power sector about $9.6 billion annually. Though proponents of the rule, including the EPA, have argued that these costs will be well paid for by health benefits in the form of fewer premature deaths, fewer heart and asthma attacks, um, and things like that. Uh, while opponents of the rule, including coal and electric industry groups, have argued that the EPA has exaggerated these health benefits and that really only a small portion of the purported benefits would actually come from reducing mercury, whereas the other purported benefits would come from regulating pollutants that are already regulated under the Clean Air Act. While these standards were challenged in federal court the, and the Supreme Court did rule that the EPA violated the Clean Air Act by not considering the costs of the rule when it decided to regulate power plants, uh, the Supreme Court only ruled that the EPA produced a cost benefit analysis, which it did in April of this year. And so the case was remanded to the DC Circuit Court. And as of now, it remains in, the rule remains in effect while the DC Circuit decides whether uh, the EPA's actions addresses the Supreme Court's discerns, concerns. And next we have ground level ozone standards. And these standards are a subset of national air quality standards on the, under the Clean Air Act. Uh, these standards target what's commonly actually known as smog. And smog is formed when various um, nitrogen oxides from natural and human-made human -made sources combined with other organic materials to uh, produce smog. And so the EPA last year lowered the standard from 75 parts per billion to 70 parts per billion. And the EPA has argued that this lower standard would um, help mitigate the negative health effects linked to smog, such as heart and lung disease. And it would help those most affected by smog, such as asthmat asthmatics, the elderly and young children. So the debate over, over these standards, is, these lower standards is focused on their purported costs and benefits, um, as well as if they're really actually necessary to protect public health. Um, the EPA has estimated that these standards would cost $1.4 billion annually, um, which would be, of course, be borne by individual states, localities. Um, but the agency has argued that these would also produce health benefits, including um, fewer premature deaths, asthma, fewer asthma attacks, fewer days when people miss work, fewer asthma-related hospital visits. Um, while opponents of lowering the standard have argued that the EPA has overestimated these benefits and that the standards will not produce the promised health benefits. And um, another concern is whether states and localities can actually meet these standards. So the Congressional Research Service found about 25 states and 224 counties have not yet met previous standards of 75 parts per billion. And that has been a large part of the debate of whether these um, new standards are ne help necessary from a health point of view and are feasible. 
So one of the reasons that we're talking about all these regulations in relation to the presidential election is that whoever is um, uh, put, whoever is played, who is selected to replace Aunt, um, Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court will weigh in on some of these regulations. Um, so two, so the two that have been blocked by a court order, the Clean Power Plan and the Waters of the United States rule are both expected to go in front of the Supreme Court. And so it's, there's a big question over who, who becomes the next president and then what happens with the next Senate so that they can weigh in on the Supreme Court. Um, and then two of the rules that are already being implemented, Matt's and Ozone rule, um, the next president or the next Congress, if they wanted to, could step in and, and do potentially do something about those rules if they decided that they wanted to strengthen them or, or weaken them. Cool. Okay, this is um, kind of a fun part. We're just going to get into some predictions. These are just Taylor and I brainstorming some ideas of what we think potential energy environmental issues that the next Congress would probably want to deal with, um, depending on the leanings of those congressional members. Um, okay, so I'll talk about Republican issues quickly. So if Republicans have either um, control of the House or the Senate, some things that we'll see them probably bring up is blocking or uh, preventing the Clean Power Plan from going into effect and the Waters of the United States rule. There's also been talk about making changes to the Endangered Species Act. Um, they might propose federal land transfers, taking some federal lands that are uh, managed by government agencies like the BLM and transferring this back to the states. There could be an expansion offshore drilling. Um, oil and gas drilling on federal lands will probably continue. And then there may be potential changes to the renewable fuel standard, which is how ethanol uh, is part of gas. And then Taylor, do you want to talk about those Democratic issues? Sure. Um, under a Democratic Congress, um, which may not be likely if the Democrats hold the House, don't, uh, don't control the House, um, it is still expected that if Democrats do gain a good foothold in Congress that the Clean Power Plan goes forward. Um, absent the Democrats controlling Congress and uh, if Hillary Clinton becomes president, she would likely appoint a justice that would um, rule favorably on the Clean Power Plan if it comes to the Supreme Court, whereas um, if Donald Trump becomes president, he'll likely appoint a justice that would not le lean very favorably in, front of, uh, in favor of the Clean Power Plan. Um, Democrats would like to see um, more fracking regulation. Um, Democrats have proposed a carbon tax, which could mean a lot of different things, but in general, um, it means a certain charge on coal and oil and natural gas in proportion to the amount of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases they produce. This was in the Democratic platform. Um, they would probably endorse changes to the renewable fuel standard. Um, Democrats have proposed limits to drilling offshore and on federal lands, um, purportedly in order to um, reduce fossil fuel consumption in a way to combat human-made climate change. And Democrats and Republicans are in favor of drinking water regulation and um, drinking water infrastructure improvements. Although the one thing with Democrats is that they may push for a little bit more federal involvement with drinking water regulations. They may endorse updates or revisions to the Safe Drinking Water Act, for example, or propose more federal funding for localities that deal with water quality issues, particularly in places like Flint, Michigan, that have had um, very, very severe water quality problems. Uh, thank you all very much for your time. If you have any questions, there's both the Q&A tool and then the chat that you can use to ask us. Anything that you would like? Um, I'd like to start off, maybe uh, Taylor, I can throw this question at you. Um, we talked a little bit about potential changes to the Endangered Species Act. Do you mind speaking a little bit more about what some of those may be? Sure. So the Republican Party platform has called for revisions to the Endangered Species Act. And what the Republicans want to do is to balance protection of endangered species with protection of property rights, which Republicans argue the current ESA just does not do. So they would likely propose changes to the way species are listed as endangered. They'll probably um, propose um, certain changes to the way in which certain species are listed. They'll probably 
alter the way the criteria in which species are listed and they'll try to balance the potential benefits of protecting a species with the potential economic impact of listing a species because the Endangered Species Act does um, place quite large requirements on land use once a species is listed. So if an endangered species cannot have its habitat adversely modified um, by developers or property owners or things like that if it's endangered. So Republicans will probably seek changes to that process in order to allow a little bit more economic development and a little bit more involvement from private property owners than is currently allowed by the Federal Endangered Species Act. Thank you. Well, if we don't have any more questions, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. If you have questions later, please reach out. You can email us, editor at ballotpedia.org. We're also on Twitter at ballotpedia or facebook.com slash ballotpedia with any other questions. And tomorrow we'll be meeting at the same time and talking about healthcare policy. And that'll be our colleague, Sarah, who will be giving that presentation. So hopefully you all can join us and have an excellent day. Thank you so much. Thank you.